If you like it, then you should have put an urine on it. And if you were to stick your finger through an urine or an aromatic molecule, then you'd actually be sticking your finger through like a donut of electron charge. Um, so basically all of the atoms that link up to form molecules, they do so by sharing pairs of electrons. Sometimes they can share, normally they're just sharing with like their next door neighbor. So it'd be like this is sharing with this and this is sharing with this. But sometimes they share with like a more than one electron and you get this like electron delocalization um or this conjugates this resonance so today we're talking phenylalanine and aromaticity um and today's going to be a little uh more technical um but i'm trying to just like give you an intuitive sense about thinking about aromaticity in biochemistry in particular um so not going into all of the details of molecular orbital theory and all of that but really where does the aromaticity um where does resonance where does this conjugation come up in biochemistry and how should we think about it um and what do you need to know as a biochemist in order to like appreciate um all the cool things it can do um and so Sorry, it's going to be more technical and more bumbly because I have a meeting to go to later. Um, presenting a poster, yay! Okay, um, but anyway, so just a more bumbly, briefer kind of talk today um, on aromaticity. And if you want some more background, um, check out past posts. But I'm kind of just going to dive right in um, today and talk about some of these concepts. Um, so yes, so phenylalanine is one of the three amino acids that is aromatic. And when we talk about aromatic, this means that you have this, um, a resonance or a stabilized ring. Um, so resonance or conjugation is where atoms are sh more than atoms are sharing electrons with more than just the atom next to each other. Um, and this makes them more stable and it makes them all have partial double bonded character. Today's post is like mainly about aromaticity, but we'll also talk about th when this happens outside of a ring. So it's like electron um, conjugation, electron delocalization, there's different terms for it. Um, but so it's like happening in the peptide bonds, it's happening in carboxylic carboxylate groups, um, this where you have this like partial double bonded character. There are three aromatic amino acids, uh, phenylalanine, which we'll talk about today, um, tyrosine and tryptophan. The other common place where you will see um, aromaticity in biochemistry is in the nitrogenous bases of DNA and RNA. And so later we'll look at how this allows them to like base stack um, in like form double-stranded, um, stronger double-stranded structures, and also how it will allow them to kind of like base stack with um, amino acids. Um, like these, these aromatic amino acids can kind of like pretend like they're a base um, and interact with the DNA and RNA. Um, and so this lets proteins and nucleic acids hang out. And we'll also look at how their aromaticity is going to help us see them with UV. What happens when you have an aromatic ring is that each of these atoms, so these all represent individual atoms. So these are carbons and these are hydrogens, nitrogens, oxygens. So they share one pair. They spend like an electron to share a pair of electrons to form a single bond with the thing next to it. But then sometimes they also they they fill they fill all these single bonds and then they're like ah eh, we still have extra electrons and so they want help sharing these electrons so basically they put them in this like electron commune I like to think about it so basically this is like they're all going to be sharing throughout this resonance stabilized ring and when they're sharing they're sharing it through these like pi bonds which involve these like um, p orbitals so these are actually going to be like your electrons are going to be above and below the plane of the ring um and speaking of plane in order for this to happen this has to be in a plane so a lot of times you see them like that when they form these single bonds they can rotate around and stuff but when you have a double bond you can't rotate and we talked about this when we we're talking about the peptide backbone and why you can't like rotate around the peptide backbone because that's resonance stabilized um so these have partial double bond character. So double bonds, if you have like a full double bond, then it's like, so you can think about single bonds and double bonds. And then a resonance structure is kind of like where you have partial double bond character because you're sharing the double bondedness um, with more than just like a single atom. So if you have a single bond, what this is involving is these um these bonds basically they're like cylinders um the electrons that are shared it's like a cylinder and so you can think of it um kind of like so my arm so i can rotate my wrist and i can rotate my shoulder 
and my hands and my sh my hand and my shoulder are still connected even if I rotate uh, it's hard to rotate just your wrist without rotating your elbow but so you can so you can basically you can see that since it's a cylinder I can rotate either of these so you can rotate around a single bond without like breaking the bond and the electron density so the stuff that they're sharing to form that bond is going to be like between the two of them but if you have like a pi bond um a pi what you have is this involving like p orbitals and so basically these orbitals um which then like combine this is like molecular orbital theory and stuff i'm not going to go into but basically you have these orbitals so the orbitals are the places where the electrons are hanging out um so in the sigma bonds we were talking about so these were like our normal bonds um so these would be like the single bonds and in the case of a double bond what you actually have is like one sigma bond and then one of these pi bonds we're going to talk about but so in the sigma bond your electron density is like in this like cylinder between them but in a pi bond basically you have this like hourglass thing where you have like electron density above and below the plane so if i wanted to form a bond between like my two arms say okay so now i form a bond all's good but what if i rotate one of them now these are not lined up so i can't form a bond between them so this is why in a double bond you need to have them like planar you need to have them in a line so this is why you need to have in your in the benzene ring you need to have everything be planar so in an aromatic ring everything needs to be planar in our peptide bond where we have that resonance we have that double but partial double bond between the oxygen the carbon and the nitrogen you're going to have that needs to be um planar as well and so you can't rotate around it so the when you have the key thing is that when you have resonance when you have this like electron delocalization this conjugation there's different terms um but basically what it means is that you have this partial double bond character that's shared throughout and so since it's a partial double bo so bond it has to follow like the convention like it has to follow the rules of being a double bond meaning like you can't rotate around it and it also means that these are like these bonds will be shorter um than just a single bond but remember, so with the double bond, it's not like you have two single bonds. So the second bond is like weaker. The pi bond is like weaker if just like a normal um, double bond. Um, because so you have that one sigma bond and this is involving the electrons that are like closer together and stuff. And you can see with a sigma bond because your electron density, so the stuff that you're sharing, it's actually like the density, like the electrons are found most frequently between the two nuclei. So where the protons are and so this is why you have the the bond is like stronger um when you have a when you have a pi bond so this is like the bond we're adding on top of the single bond to give us a double bond when you have one of these bonds because your electron density is kind of like more spread out and it's like above and below and all of this stuff um instead so you're you're kind of like instead of the clouds like instead of these molecules like electron clouds merging like head on they're merging like side to side and so these are going to be weaker but you're adding it on top of already having a single bond and so this is why you get that strongerness if you have just like a normal double bond though because that pi bond is weaker you can get that to like react and do stuff um and so like alkene groups um we have like a double bond um you can then like add stuff to them um and like that sort of thing but when you have basically when you have something that's resonance stabilized it's going to be really unreactive because everybody's invested in this so in this ring every single guy has something in this game because they're all sharing into that commune so if one of them drops out then they're all going to be unhappy and if they're all unhappy then the molecules are happy right so they're all invested in this and so the molecule is really stable um, so when you have resonance stabilization, then you're not going to get these react molecules are not very reactive, but they can do cool stuff like absorb light. Um, so we'll talk more about. And so how do you know if something is aromatic? There's basically this thing called there's like these rules that you like count the electrons and that sort of thing. Um, I'm not going to get into that here. But basically, if you see like alternating double and single bonds in a ring, that's indicating that it's aromatic and so sometimes you won't see the alternating double and single bonds sometimes there'll be like a gap but there will be like a nitrogen or an oxygen there if that has a lone pair that can also participate in this um so we can basically and you can also get if you have you can have resonance or electron de 
localization like in a non in a non ring um but if and if it's in a ring then we call it aromatic we call it an airing um so the most common example that you'll probably see of an aromatic molecule is benzene which is like a six membered ring um with sometimes it's shown like alternating single double bonds sometimes it's shown like a dotted circle inside um they're all trying to show that these are like this is resonance stabilized so this electron density is being shared throughout there's double bonded character throughout um we if you see like alternating double and single bonds just like in a linear molecule that can also be um resonance stabilized and remember um there too the uh, nitrogen or an oxygen if it has like a lone pair it can also participate and i'm not going to get into the rules about how you determine that there's like all sorts of stuff on that um and like okram and stuff when you have one of these systems we can draw these like resonance structures so we can draw basically if you have something that is aromatic or something that is resonance stabilized you can basically draw um you can draw resonance structures so basically like shift around the electrons to draw it so that there's a double bond between like each of the different atoms so sometimes there's certain resonance structures that are like more like more stable or whatever and so that's more that would have more like so th that, those would have like more double bonded character than the others but there's really like you don't really have these resonance structures like bouncing back and forth it's really just like trying to show that the real thing is something in between and so sometimes it might not be like exactly the same amount of double bondedness throughout all of them because some of them might be a little more um favored um but when you're talking about like a benzene ring where everything is just like the same then you have this like these are all going to have the same partial bond double bonded character so you might think that these would be kind of boring um so they are we've talked about hydrocarbons being boring how when you just have like carbon and hydrogen because they're going to share pretty fairly um and when they share fairly um then basically the there's no there's no like vulnerabilities there's nothing fun happening there's no reactivity but what happens is if you have like a resonance stabilized ring what you have because you have that like donut of electron density above and below you can kind of get them to like sync up their um sync up the donuts um and so what you see with like dna and rna is that you might think that like the base pairing so like across the strands that that's the like the main force holding dna together but it's actually the base stacking um that's like the predominant force so basically these bases so because they're these like hydrocarbons they're uh non-polar um so the water doesn't really want to hang out with them so it's going to like hide them in the center um but when they're hidden when they're like pushed in the center because you have like that stairways like thing of these bases and these bases are aromatic they're going to be able to, you have those like donuts of charge above and below stacked up on top of each other. And so if one of them shifts the like randomly or just like if it's induced charge or whatever, something charge come near, they can like shift their electrons. Um, so these electrons are all whizzing about. We draw these orbitals where they're like most likely to be, but they can be like anywhere in there, right? And so if you have more electrons on one part than another, that part's gonna be partly negative, that part's gonna be partly positive. So if you have like partly negative up here and then up on the, the base above it if it's it's electrons are gonna be like eh, negative charge and run away and then that's going to it's you're going to have like this rippling effect where you have these like all their clouds kind of like sync up um and then you get this like base stacking interactions so what happens when you have aromatic amino acids like phenylalanine is that they can actually then like participate they can actually bond um they can actually like base stack with dna and rna bases and this can help proteins like interact with um dna and rna um so there's cool stuff that you can do even if you just have a hydrocarbon if you have um resonance stabilization if you have this aromaticity um so it might be really stable, um, but it can still um, still do cool stuff. In addition to having these these like orbital these like bonding orbitals that they're in, there's also like other places where the electrons can hang out if they get enough energy. But they don't have enough energy at this point. But if you give them enough energy, they can kind of like jump up to a higher energy level. Um, and it turns out that when you have resonance, when you have conjugation, the distance to get to the next energy level, so the distance between this, the, um, the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, basically the place where you have electrons and the place where electrons could go if they had enough energy, the distance between those places is smaller, so it takes less energy to get them to jump up. 
and so then they can often absorb um this often corresponds to wavelengths of light that we can see so aromatic molecules are often um you have like a highly conjugated molecule you get like a dye and stuff because it's absorbing like visible light which is a long enough wavelength a lower energy wavelength um and when it absorbs that light then it like steals it from the rainbow and so you can't see um you see a color when you have um so when you that happens with like extensive conjugation um but because like the more conjugation you have the more resonance you have the lower in distance to the next level type of thing but you can still absorb light um if you have just like a single benzene ring so with one of these like six-sided rings um with and so what happens in one of these is um you don't since you don't have as extensive of conjugation then it's going to take um more energy to get to the next level there's less of the just there's more of a distance to the next energy level so you need higher energy light to get there and so that's going to absorb like uv light so we can use aromatic um the aromatic rings of proteins and dna in order to measure like how the concentration of them based on how much uv light they absorb at specific wavelengths and so proteins absorb predominantly at 280 and dna and rna their bases absorb uh, more predominantly at 260 so you can look at like 260 to 280 ratios to see if you have more like pure protein pure dna pure rna that sort of thing Proteins, they also remember they have that um, resonance in their backbone. And so this also, because it has that resonance, it's going to have a smaller jump to the next level. And so it's going to absorb, that peptide bond will absorb some too at about 230. Um, but this is like weaker absorbance. So when we're talking about where we're going to get absorbance in proteins, we have three aromatic amino acids. So three that have resonance stabilized rings. These three are phenylalanine, which is the star of today's story. Tyrosine, which is like phenylalanine, except it has an OH group. And you actually will see, you actually make like half of the phenylalanine that you eat is used to make tyrosine. And that tyrosine could be used to make like hormones and that sort of thing. And then tryptophan. Um, and so tryptophan is a weirder looking thing. It's got like two rings, but they're still conjugated. So it's all like interconnected. And because you have more extensive conjugation with the tryptophan, you're going to get a more, uh, you're going to get more UV absorbance. Um, and so this is going to be the predominant um, source of the UV absorption coming from proteins. Today, we're going to talk about phenylalanine um, and we'll all stuff about phenylalanine, um, such as how it's used to make tyrosine and how people who have mutations in um, a gene for converting phenylalanine to tyrosine um, have this disease called PKU, phenylketonuria, uh, ketonuria, which is why you see those labels on like um, sugar-free products, caution, like phenylketonuronix contains phenylalanine. Um, and so that's because like aspartate, so the sweetener, it has like a dipeptide um, and it has one of them is felt, it has phenylalanine. Um, so people who have this disorder um, where they can't break down phenylalanine or convert phenylalanine, um, they should avoid that food, right? So um, that's why the, why the warnings are there and we'll talk some more about that, but I have way more on that in my po whole post on PKU. Um, so yeah, so today, um, sorry, it's kind of rambly, um, but I've got a meeting to go to later. Um, and so hope this was at least somewhat helpful. Okay, now that I've gotten ba the stuff about aromaticity in general out of the way, um, let me t tell you more about phenylalanine in particular, um, because this is part of 20 days amino acids. And I was just using phenylalanine as an excuse, um, to teach you about aromaticity. Um, and that's one of my favorite things about uh, the 20 days of amino acids is that I can introduce all these concepts in context and show you different things. And so I hope you're having fun too. So we're at phenylalanine. Um, and so it's nickname or it's three letter um, abbreviation is PHE and its initial is F. Yeah, what the F white? Well, P was taken by proline as we'll see later. Um, so its side chain is a benzyl group. Um, and so this might be um, kind of confusing, um, but basically a benzyl, so a benzene ring is where you just have like the, this ring, but if it's attached to something, then it's a phenyl group. And if you have this, if it has a, um, if it has a, um, sorry, if it has a methylene linker, so a CH2, 
um, before the linkage point, then it's because of benzyl group. So phenylalanine's whole side chain is a benzyl group, but it's, so it's basically, it has a phenyl group attached to alanine. Um, so basically here, if you replace this with a benzyl group, uh, if you replace this H with a phenyl group, then you have a benzyl group. And so you have, and that's what you have with phenylalanine. And so it's like you have a phenyl group attached to an alanine. So it's phenylalanine. So yeah, so that's how it got its name. No cool story there really. Um, but anyway, um, so it's coded for by UUU and UUC. Um, and it, um, yeah, so it's aromatic, um, nonpolar and hydrophobic. Um, it's also big. Um, so it's over here in the bigness scale. Um, there's only a few of them that are bigger. Um, so it's very, very hydrophobic because it has all of this hydrocarbonness, um, lots and lots of hydrogens and carbons. Um, and you have that uh, resonance stabilization. Um, so basically, yeah, water doesn't really want to hang out with it. And so it's going to be found often in like the center of proteins. Um, also, also in like binding sites for like nucleic acids and stuff because it can do that um, base to base interactions, um, the pi bond stacking. Um, and so um, another important thing before I like, so with the, when you have like pi bond interactions, you can also have like edge to face interactions and like cation to pi interactions. So basically, because you have this charge localized like here and here, you can have things kind of like, it doesn't have to be another base that's interacting. It can have like an ion, so like a metal ion or something um, that can come and it can like interact with the face and stuff. So there's all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and there's all different ways that these can um, interact with other molecules. Um, but, okay, sorry, I just wanted to point that out there. Um, so yeah, so basically, um, phenylalanine is both glucogenic and ketogenic. Um, so it can be broken down into acetoacetyl-CoA, um, which can be used for lipid making or turned into ketone bodies, which we talked about in our post the other day. Um, and it can also be um, transformed into fumarate. Um, so one of the, I mean, one of the components of the tribox tricarboxylic acid cycle, aka Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. And so it can be converted into oxaloacetate and used to make glucose. Um, and so it's glucogenic that way and it's ketogenic that way. So it's both. Um, so it's essential, I mean, in the dietary sense, which means that we need to get it from our food. We can't make it ourselves. Um, but we actually, we make tyrosine from phenylalanine. So about half of the phenylalanine we actually eat it we eat is actually used to make tyrosine um and then this tyrosine can be used to, to make proteins or hormones or melanin or broken down uh, for energy and like spare parts um and so there's this disease called pku or fetal ketonuria um it involves a mutation in this pah enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase um, and that's the enzyme that's actually going to turn phenylalanine into tyrosine. So if there's a mutation there, then the phenylalanine can't get broken down the usual way. Um, so it's going to build up and break down in alternative ways that produce um, phenyl ketones, um, so the, which gives us the name. Um, and it also like uses up shared resources, um, throwing off energy production, and it's like taking the tyrosine that's needed for other things, and so it can cause big problems. Um, yeah, so here's how it normally things normally go, something like this, where you have your phenylalanine. Um, this PAH enzyme is going to convert it to tyrosine, and that tyrosine could be used to make thyroid hormones. It can be used to make catecholamine hormones, so like adrenaline, dopamine. Um, and melanin, um, or it can get broken down. Uh, but this pathway is blocked with people with PKU. Um, and so then you get alternative pathways, um, and then you get these um, various side products, as well as having problems with um, the tyrosine, um, needing tyrosine and that sort of thing. Um, so this is normally what happens when you have like excess phenylalanine. Um, so you convert to tyrosine. Um, and you can also have disorders with um, tyro like tyrosinemia, where you have a problem mutation in the next step. 
Um, so there's various places along this pathway that you can have mutations. Um, and but with PKU, we're talking about a mutation um, like this classical PKU, you're having a mutation in um, this PAH enzyme. But yeah, so you can see here how phenylalanine gets broken down. And so you can see here that it's making this um, these products that can be used for ketogenesis or um, glucogenesis. And so that's why it is both glucogenic and ketogenic. If you want to learn more about like conjugation and how it involves like the differences with energy levels and how it's going to like, affect absorption, um, then I highly recommend checking out ChemGuide um, UK. Um, I can post a link. Um, it's a really, really helpful um, resource. And basically, you can see how the, um, the orbitals, the like levels are going to get, sorry, the orbital levels, they basically get closer together. Um, and this is going to be like, so you're absorbing uh, lower energy light in order to move between them. So if you, um, yeah, so I highly check out, recommend checking out this site and they have a bunch of other um, concepts as well um, that you can look into and yeah so highly recommend dibs wise it was first described in 1879 by shoals and barbary um, they found it in yellow lupine seedlings um, and then was first synthesized in 1882 by erlenmeyer and lip and there's a lot more details and figures in the blog version of this that i'll link but now gotta go <laughs>